Hi, my name is Ruwenda. I'm a protein biochemist at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. I'm also passionate about nature and sustainability. I work for the Sustainability Institute just outside Stellenbosch and I'm also a member of Biomimicry SA. And it's really a privilege to share some thoughts and ideas with you. The topic of this lecture is sustainability and the poly crisis. It's really about where we are, what will happen if we don't change our ways and continue with business as usual, and then how do we possibly change the course we're on. There are many definitions when it comes to sustainability and sustainable development, but most of them include a reference to our social and environmental practices that should protect and enhance the natural resources of the planet as well as the human resources. So sustainability is really a way of thinking about the way we live on this planet so that our children and our grandchildren children will inherit a future that is at least as good as today but preferably better. So unfortunately our environmental and social practices have done quite the opposite. Uh, the well-being of our planet and therefore the well-being of our generation and future generations have been severely compromised by the way we've used resources and produced waste in unsustainable manners. So now we face a multitude of problems that affect all of us. And these problems, many of them have reached crisis level. And when you start to think about them, you realize that they are interconnected. They feed into each other. Um, and you can't really solve one of these problems without addressing the rest. And we now refer to this as the global poly crisis. So in the next couple of moments, I want to look at the several components that make up this global poly crisis. So you might be familiar with the first component, global warming. The International Panel on Climate Change has reported that the planet is warming up due to greenhouse gas emissions. It is a controversial subject. Not everyone is in agreement in terms of how much of greenhouse gas emissions and subsequent planet warming is uh, because of human activity. But most scientists do agree that if the planet warms with so much as two degrees Celsius, we will definitely face major economic, social, uh, economic and environmental challenges. The second component is oil peak. Now, oil peak doesn't mean that we are running out of oil. It simply means that we are not discovering as many oil, new oil fields as we used to, so the discovery rate is decreasing and our cost of production has increased as well. So we've basically tapped the easy, high quality oil sources and now we need to go deeper to access an uh, inferior quality of oil. So really what oil peak means is the end of cheap oil. And this is going to have major economic repercussions because 60% of the global economy relies on the availability of cheap oil. The third component is that of material flows. The International Resource Panel reports that in 2011 alone, we extracted 60 billion tons of primary resources from the earth. That's almost a 40% increase in terms of what we extracted in 1980. The problem is that we live on a finite planet where all resources are limited. We simply cannot continue at this rate of consumption. And who uses all of this stuff that we extract and produce? 20% of people living in the richest countries in the world account for almost 90% of private consumption expenditure. The poor certainly aren't driving global warming or the extraction of primary resources and fossil fuels, but they will certainly feel the negative impact of these crises. Poverty and inequality go hand in hand. 
Despite three decades of global commitment to poverty eradication, we've actually seen an increase in the amount of people living in poverty. 80% of the sub-Saharan African population is classified as poor, meaning they live on less than two US dollars per day. We've also reached a point where more people live in cities than in rural areas. So we're now looking at a global urban population. And it's reported that 1 billion out of the almost 7 billion people on the planet now live in slums. 75% of these slums are in developing countries. We are expected to reach a population of 10 billion people by 2030. And one of the biggest crises is how will we feed all of them? Food is traded like a commodity and not a basic human right and vulnerable communities suffer the most uh, because of the instability in food prices. We can clearly see this in terms of how many people are malnourished. It's also interesting to note the increase in obesity that we've seen um, as a global trend. Now, being overweight doesn't necessarily mean that you are eating too much food. It could also reflect the fact that you do not have access to healthy, nutritious food you simply cannot afford to buy the right food to eat. Either way, this picture clearly shows that many people in this world are food insecure. And more healthy, nutritious food is not going to appear magically. We're starting to see a decrease in food production, and it's not for lack of trying. It's just that industrial agricultural methods have really stripped the land's ability to produce fertile soils. Through our use of chemicals and fertilizers, we have really degraded our, our lands. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, already in 2005, stated that 60% of the world's ecosystem services are degraded or severely compromised. Ecosystem services, as you can see on the slide, are those things that nature provides for free that we depend on and obviously take for granted. Things like having clean air, uh, the decomposition of our waste, and as well as the recycling of our carbon dioxide. So these are the components of the global poly crisis. And I'm sure if you sit and reflect on them, the connections between them will become clear. Like I said earlier, you cannot solve one of these problems without addressing the others. I think this paints a clear picture that illustrates we have reached the limit of this planet's tolerance and we need to dramatically rethink the way we live here. Wow, that's a lot of bad news to receive in eight minutes. But here's the thing, it can change because we can change. And yes, there is a certain level of policy that could make a major difference in terms of the global poly crisis, but we need a grassroots movement as well. It's not only government's responsibility to change this, it's our responsibility too. I believe that it starts with a change in mindset. Mainstream thinking tells us that sustainability is the small area of compromise between society, the uh, economy and the environment. And it's this kind of thinking that keeps us in the poly crisis pickle. You know Einstein said that you can't use the same thinking that got you into the problem to get you out of it. We need a new way of thinking about these things. Sustainability shouldn't be a compromise. It should be embedded in everything we do. We need to develop an economy and society that operate within the limits of our planet. What if our economy didn't dictate our society, but instead operated within our society to facilitate the equal distribution of resources? And what if our economy and society actually enhanced and contributed to the natural world instead of just depleting its resources and degrading its space? This model of uh, embedded sustainability is a new way of thinking about the way we live here and it's exactly what we need. Great in theory, but how do we put it into practice? 
I'd like to share an example of how we can think differently. Nature can teach us how to live within the limits and boundaries of our planet. And when we need to come up with new innovations and solutions, when we need to design products and processes and systems, we can look to nature for inspiration. It makes sense to look to organisms and ecosystems for inspiration because they really face the same challenges we do. They need to glue things together and create color for various reasons. They need to transport water over great distances and often against gravity. They need to protect themselves from external forces and they also get sick and need to treat illness. Nature has figured out sustainable solutions for all of these challenges. This is one of my favorite examples of nature-inspired innovation, the Shinkansen bullet train in Japan, the world's fastest train. It travels about 320 kilometers per hour. At the top you see what the train looked like originally. Um, one of the big problems with the train was that it created a lot of noise. Because of the, the blunt end of the train, uh, whenever it went through a tunnel there would be a pressure build up and as it exits the tunnel there was this loud booming noise which almost made them shut down the train. The chief engineer who was tasked to solve this problem happened to be an avid bird watcher and he realized that the kingfisher dives from the air into the water at an incredible speed without creating so much as a splash. So he modeled the front end of the Shinkansen train after the beak of the kingfisher and the result, a quiet train that uses 15% less electricity and is 10% faster. This is what we call biomimicry, the conscious emulation of life's genius. It's the technology of biology, how to make a fiber like a spider, how to harness the sun's energy like a leaf, how to compute like a neuron. There are so many examples of successful designs that were inspired by nature, and I encourage you to go to the website to learn more. In closing, I would like to leave you with this. Whether you work in a laboratory or in the field, whether you're an architect, designer, engineer, scientist, educator, economist or writer, you have the choice to live sustainably and to be an agent of change. And it starts by changing the way you think and the way you act. So let's not just strive to reduce our carbon footprint, but rather focus on creating and leaving behind a positive footprint. It really is up to you. What legacy will you leave behind?